Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to the podcast. In this episode, we're taking a trip down memory lane as we dive into the archives and bring back a classic. This is a re-release of episode 68 titled Victoria Rising Tales of Innovation and Adaptation in Southern Australia. For those of you who are new to the podcast, I had the amazing opportunity to visit Australia a while back to speak at a conference hosted by the Victoria State Government. During my time there, I had the chance to record interviews with attendees who are doing some incredible adaptation work in NGOs, state government, and the private sector. It was a special experience for me as it was my first time back in Australia since I lived there in the early 2000s. And I've always had a soft spot for that country. Even though I haven't followed the change in the state government's leadership since then, I'm sure there's still plenty we can learn from their efforts and adaptation. I know we have many Aussie listeners out there, so I encourage you to listen and reach out and let me know what's going on with adaptation efforts in Oz. But that's not all. I also have some exciting new material for you. As a bonus, frequent guest on the podcast, Dr. Amy Brady, will be talking about her new book, Ice, From Mixed Drinks to Skating Rinks, A Cool History of a Hot Commodity. It's always a pleasure to have Amy on the show. But before we get started, I wanted to share legendary Academy Award winning director Oliver Stone is back with Nuclear Now, his first film in seven years, coming exclusively to theaters across the USA and Canada beginning April 28th. Based on the book A Bright Future, written by award winning scholar of international relations, Professor Joshua S. Goldstein, who also co wrote the film Nuclear Now. This film explores the possibility for the global community to overcome the challenges of climate change and energy poverty to reach a more optimistic future through the power of nuclear energy, an option that may become increasingly important in the critical years ahead. With unprecedented access to the nuclear industry in France, Russia, and the United States, director Oliver Stone delivers a revolutionary documentary that Variety has called an intensely compelling must-see film. The movie opens in New York and Los Angeles on April 28th with special one-day screening events across North America on Nuclear Now Day, May 1st, that you won't want to miss. Visit NuclearNowFilm.com Dot com to learn more. Okay, let's join Dr. Amy Brady to hear about her upcoming book, Ice, and then we'll take a journey back down under with Victoria Rising. Hey, Adapters, welcome back. After a long absence, Dr. Amy Brady returns to the podcast. If you recall, Amy is the guru of climate fiction, or cli-fi as the cool kids call it. Hey, Amy, welcome back. Hey, Doug, thanks for having me. All right. Please correct any of my (laughs) introductions there because would you say – I was still trying to come up the right word for it. I mean you're still in the thick of promoting and just really being in that space with climate fiction, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. I just – I don't know a better word than like guru, but if there's something else, (laughs) someone else is calling you, please let me – by all means. All right. So we're not here to talk cli-fi though. This is what's exciting. I think this is actually even more exciting that you've written a book. Can you tell us a bit about that? I sure can. Thank you. The book is called Ice, colon, From Mixed Drinks to Skating Rinks, A Cool History of a Hot Commodity. And this book is a cultural history of ice going back about 200 years to the dawn of the American ice trade when men were cutting and harvesting large blocks of ice out of rivers and lakes up north and then shipping it around the country to provide it to areas where ice didn't form naturally. So it starts there and then it moves forward in time to look at how the arrival of ice across the country fundamentally changed and shaped our American culture from what we eat to how we play sports to how we practice medicine and eventually to the rise of refrigeration and air conditioning and how that obsession with cool is beginning to take a toll on our planet. This sounds fascinating. The book's not out yet, so I haven't had a chance to read, but I wanted to bring you on to talk about it and other people I'm sure you're going to be interested in, in reading this book. But Ice, what inspired you to write about this topic? Well, as you know, Doug, I am an environmentally minded person, so I've always cared about the environmental aspects of ice. But a few years ago, during a really brutal heat wave, I was drinking a glass of water that had ice in it. And I just flashed to this time when I was traveling through Europe and I asked for a glass of ice water and people looked at me like I had something growing out of my head (laughs) because folks... 
around the world, you know, especially, you know, in some places in, in Western Europe and in other places around the world, they don't put ice in their drinks. And so I got to thinking about why was I the odd person out over there? You know, what is it about my Americanness that is so obsessed with ice? So when I got back, I started looking for an article or an essay or just something that could shed some light on this. And I couldn't find anything, nothing satisfying. So I took on the research myself. And that led me to various archives around the country to come conversations with experts, including cultural experts, sports experts, medical experts, historians. And pretty soon a history, a story started to reveal itself. And it was wilder and stranger than I would ever have guessed. Wow, that is kind of an unusual inspiration for it. All right, so th the book's going to come out, and I, I think you're just going to have a ton of facts in there just from based on the reviews that I read. But I'm curious, when was the actual first artificial ice created? Was it in America? I mean, did, did you get into that? I did. So artificial ice in the United States was discovered or the, the process of making it was discovered by a Dr. John Gorey in the 1840s in a most unusual location. He learned how to make artificial ice in Apalachicola, Florida, which is not a place we associate with ice. But in a way, it makes sense, right? Because ice doesn't form naturally there very often. So this was a doctor who was dead set on finding a cure for yellow fever, which in the early half of the 19th century was just a dirge on society. It was a deadly disease that resulted in the deaths of thousands of people every year. And he got it in his head that if he could cool the temperature of a person's body, it would help to cure the disease. Now, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to us now because we know that it's actually mosquitoes that carry the disease, but doctors and experts didn't know that back then. All they knew is that when the temperatures got really hot, aka when mosquitoes started to come out, people started to fall sick with the disease. So his thinking was, cool the temperature and people will get better. But the only way he knew how to cool temperature was to use ice and he couldn't find it himself. And ice that was shipped from the north was very, very expensive and only available at certain times of the year. So if he wanted ice, he had to learn to make it himself. And he eventually did. And here's the wild thing about John Gorey's story is that when he announced his creation or his discovery, it was responded to with cries of blasphemy. Like, wow. how dare a man try to create ice? Only God can create ice. And so it didn't catch on. And he actually died a penniless man oh, wow. who, you know, was resentful of a world that didn't embrace his discovery. It really wasn't until the Civil War when the, you know, the ice trade was halted, you know, at the, the Mason-Dixon line, you know, shipments from the North were not allowed into the South, that the South started looking for ways to, to supplement their ice. And they rediscovered Gorey's patents. They built the machine. They improved upon it. That led to giant ice plants that could produce, you know, hundreds of blocks of ice every day. And then that in turn just led to the spread of ice throughout the country to, to the point where we are now the ice obsessed nation that we are. Fascinating. And speaking of Florida, I've read quite a bit like how air condition radically altered Florida's path and its future. Did you find any similarities? Was air conditioning and ice, do they, are they twins in this process? Do you see a lot of overlap in how the demand for it and how it kind of spread throughout the country? Yeah, actually, to go back to John Gorey for a moment, you know, when he was trying to figure out once he had ice, how can I use ice to cool my patient's bodies? He realized that if he placed ice directly on a patient's skin, that that could eventually cause some damage, right? So what he did is he drilled holes into the bottom of clean bedpans, filled them with ice, and then suspended the bedpans in a room so that when air flew over the ice or flowed over the ice, rather, the cool air would drop through the holes and start to cool the room. So he basically invented the world's first air conditioner. Then that contraption was also adopted by doctors and nurses for decades afterwards. Very cool. Okay. So people are thinking, all right, this is a climate change podcast and we're getting yeah. there. And that, <laughs> that was a major catalyst and point that you're trying to make in this book, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So the spread of ice around the country changed 
how Americans relate to cool, right? We suddenly began to rely on ice to preserve our food and to cool our rooms and to heal our bodies. Well, as technology developed, we improved upon the ways that we can maintain coolness. And so that led to the rise of refrigeration and air conditioning all the way up to the models that we know today. Well, <laughs> air conditioning and refrigeration are among the biggest energy draws of all domestic households and restaurants and hospitals and other commercial spaces. And those things are really taking a toll on the planet. And so what I also looked at in this book were different models of refrigeration that are being researched so that we can eventually adopt them and replace the carbon bombs that we have in our kitchens today. All right, because we talk a bit about climate adaptation on this spot. I talk a lot about climate adaptation. And <laughs> did do you see ice playing a role? And I guess almost for the worse in the sense that like ice, we're going to have extreme heat and we're having warming temperatures that we could actually make the problem worse. Was that coming it up at all? Is like we could actually exacerbate the problem? Yeah. I mean, here's the irony, right? The hotter the planet gets, the more that we're driven to seek out ice and cool ourselves down. I opened my book actually with this memory of a 2018 heat wave that was so brutal. It knocked out the power in my parents' house where I was visiting at the time. So we piled into their van and we drove to a nearby convenience store that was running on a generator where we walked in, embraced the cool air and filled glasses with ice so that we could cool down. Mm -hmm. And the irony of this is that ice makers themselves are enormous energy draws. The automatic ice makers that we have in our refrigerators at home, for example, they can increase refrigerators, their energy draw by a large percentage because they never turn off. That's why you can get ice at three in the afternoon or three in the morning. And so the hotter it gets, the more and more we want to have ice and coolness in our lives, which exacerbates the problem. And that's why, you know, these new experimental technologies are going to be so important in our future. That along with more stringent energy standards. All right. So yeah, when we had some of those heat waves in France and I think in Chicago, one of the first responses to try to get air conditionings into these places. And that's a maladaptation, even though that's saving lives, you know, big picture is creating problems. And so I, I'm, I'm right. glad to hear that there's some technologies on the way, but tell people about when's it coming out. You're going to be doing a bit of a book tour. There are opportunities to meet you in person. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, thank you so much, Doug. So the book is going to be out on June 6th uh, of this year. That's the first Tuesday in June. And it'll be in all of your local independent bookstores. And you can also purchase it online. And I am going to be doing a book tour. The tour dates aren't set yet, but I plan to be making some stops, certainly up and down the East Coast where I'm located, but also hopefully in the Midwest and out West and Southwest as well. So a great way to keep in touch is if you go to my website, which is Amy Brady writes. So Amy Brady, W R I T E S dot com. I'll be updating my tour dates there as soon as they're available. And I'd love to see you there to shake your hand and tell you how appreciative I am that you care to listen and pick up the book. Oh, I hope we can get you to Tucson. We could meet we, we haven't met. We've done so many shows with you, but we haven't actually met in person, have we? No. <laughs> no, not moment. yet. It's wild. I feel like I know I you know. so well, Dad. I know. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just going, okay, was there one moment? Well, yeah, that'd be fabulous. And just for folks, I, you can order it in advance. So I'll have links in my show notes for this episode, even though this episode will come out before the publishing date, you can order in advance. So that it's definitely look into that. Amy, always a treat. Need to get you on soon again. Maybe have another larger discussion about climate fiction. It's been a while. They're very popular episodes. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Hey adapters, we get to travel down to Melbourne, Australia. So I was invited to Melbourne to give the keynote address at the Victoria Adaptation Summit. First off, I want to thank the government of Victoria for inviting me and bringing me down to share my adaptation message. Thanks especially to Mitchell Nito for making it all happen. It was a lot of fun and great energy at this summit, and I really enjoyed giving that keynote address. It was a chance to share some of the stories from America Adapts, but the overall theme of the presentation was that we are not doing enough to promote the field of adaptation. It's an important story, it's an exciting story, and there's a lot more that we can be doing. 
the title of the presentation was Adaptation, The Greatest Story Never Told. So you can imagine the point I was trying to make. So some context for this episode. I was invited for this one-day Victoria Adaptation Summit, which was followed by the National Adaptation Conference hosted by the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility. This is a national level research group, obviously focusing on climate change and adaptation issues. So at the National Adaptation Conference, I went around with microphone in hand and just started meeting folks and doing interviews with a wide range of people attending that event. It was a real treat. There were great sessions at the conference, and I had these wonderful side conversations from experts throughout the country. So I kick off this episode talking with Kath Raleigh, the Executive Director, Climate Change Division of the Victorian Department of Environment, Land, Water, and Planning. She shares the ambitious efforts the Victoria State Government is taking on the adaptation front. I follow that conversation up with shorter conversations with people attending the National Adaptation Conference. These people represented local governments, private corporations, and nonprofit groups. And if you are at all familiar with Australians, you'll see that these people are funny, engaging, and incredibly innovative. Rarely is a conversation with an Aussie boring, even if it's a boring topic. You're going to enjoy listening to all these different voices. It was just a fun time for me, and I learned a ton. They're doing some really sophisticated work, especially at the local government and state level. And I think we have a lot to learn from them here in the United States. It was such a treat to go down to Australia. And as my listeners know, I used to live in Australia, but it's been 10 years since I've been back. And I got to go down to Melbourne. I hope I don't have to wait that long to go back the next time. Okay, adapters, let's take a journey down under to Australia. Hey, welcome back, adapters. With me on the podcast is Kath Rowley, the executive director of the Climate Change Division in Victoria's Department of Environment, Land, Water, and Planning. Kath leads the department's work on climate change mitigation and adaptation. Welcome to the podcast, Kath. Thanks, Doug. Great to be here. Well, thanks for joining America DAPS. This is part of this broader episode of my journey down to Australia, and so it's great. I'm going to be using you to sort of introduce all these other voices that I had that will be on this podcast, but I thought you could give just some broader information about what's going on in Victoria. Sure. The Victorian government was elected about three and a half years ago now, and part of their key election platform was to restore Victoria to a position of leadership on climate change action. And as a key part of that, last year, the parliament passed a new Climate Change Act. If you think about it, the act is in in a way a mini Paris agreement for adapted to a state jurisdiction. And so it establishes this architecture of what's our long-term goals, what are the steps we're going to take to get there, and it covers both mitigation, emissions reductions, adaptation, and assisting and supporting the transition from where we are now to where we want to be. And in terms of where we want to be, the Act includes our long-term goal of net zero emissions by 2050. For adaptation, the Act creates a new approach. And so rather than having a single statewide adaptation plan, we're moving to a approach of system-based adaptation planning. And so it's identified seven key systems which are either particularly exposed to climate impacts or important to how Victoria deals with climate change, including the built environment, health and human services and primary production, and it requires from 2021 that those systems work together across industry, government and the community to develop action plans for what they're going to do to better prepare and build their resilience to climate change. Just as a first step um, in the lead up to that new statutory requirement, we've got pilot adaptation action plans running in three systems, and that's basically giving us an opportunity to roll the systems-based approach and draw lessons before all of those seven systems have to do the work. There's going to be quite a few people in Australia listening to this, but there's going to be more people in North America that are listening and they're, I think, very curious. And I was hoping maybe you could just give a little bit of background, you know, what is Victoria? It's a state government down there. And then just maybe some of the, the bigger climate impacts that you're dealing with as part of all this. But just, you know, a little bit of flavor of what is Victoria? Melbourne's the capital, but people can kind of visualize what, what's sort of at stake there. 
Absolutely. So Victoria is the second most populous state in in Australia um, after New South Wales. It's in the southeastern corner of the country and Victoria has a very strongly service oriented economy. So we've got very strong education sector as well as uh, health and other services, but also mining and transport, agriculture, big dairy industry, a whole range of economic activity across the state and then a very highly urbanised population. And so Melbourne is the population centre of Victoria and is growing rapidly. And so then in terms of what climate change means for Victoria, some of the key trends which we're already observing and which we uh, all climate projections suggest will in coming decades, more hot days and heat waves, particularly in summer, harsher fire conditions. Fire conditions are a particularly important part of the Victorian landscape. We have a lot of forest, a lot of bushfire. That's a particular challenge already for Victoria and is only going to intensify with climate change. Our range Rainfall patterns are changing, and so we've got a, a decline in overall rainfall. But at the same time, we've got an intensification of rainfall. So whilst overall we've got this reduced total or average rainfall, it's falling in more intense bursts. And so despite drying, also increased flooding. We've also got rising sea levels, and because Victoria is a coastal state, we've got a very large um, challenge across our coastal zones in terms of coastal adaptation. And so these risks to our community, to our environment and to our economy are significant and they're magnified by the uncertainty in terms of what the projections can and can't tell us about the scale and timing of future impacts and how particularly those extreme events are going to change. And so our adaptation agenda is all very squarely focused on getting a better understanding in the systems themselves as well as at the regional and local level um, and being able to understand our vulnerability, understand the gaps in what we're doing about it and then developing and prioritising actions to address that. And I will have some in, more information in my show notes, but I don't think people appreciate what a world-class city Melbourne is in Victoria. You guys, I think, are spoiled down there. It competes with any European city. It's, it's a really world-class city, and the things that you guys are doing are just amazing. You use the language of that Victoria wants to restore its role as a leader. Maybe you could give a little history there. I, I thought that was a interesting. You, it was been brought up to me multiple times. And so has it get, been kind of a roller coaster? It's, I mean, it's something that you're, you're starting to focus on again. Yeah, so I think that it's fair to say that both Victoria's role but also state government's roles in climate change have waxed and waned a bit over the past couple of decades. And so in the very early days of climate change planning and action, states played a pretty strong role through ministerial councils and through just the kind of fact that at that time the national government and the state governments worked quite closely together on a range of environmental challenges, including climate change. And this was back in the 1990s. And at that time, Victoria played a really significant role in the early development of a national strategy for climate change. Then um, it kind of Kyoto Protocol kicked in and national attention to climate change ratcheted up. I'd say it's fair to say that states uh, took a bit more of a back seat. But as the nature of climate change and the challenges that it presents have evolved and as national governments have waxed and waned in their engagement, states have at times stepped up and taken more of a role. So there was a period where Victoria was working with other states on things like mitigation policy, including um, emissions trading schemes. That was in the in the 2000s, and then and then again that got picked up at the national level. That's subsequently been with, stepped back from at the national level, and states are again really exploring what policies and programs they might or should put in place to support the transition to a low emissions economy. Similarly, in adaptation, the the role of uh, the different levels of government has evolved in understanding for, on Victoria's part, and as a state government, um, we consider that all levels of government, so national, state and local, as well as other stakeholders, business, non-government organisations, community and individuals, all have a role to play in adaptation. And the Victorian government, through this new Climate Change Act, which was passed last year, is really looking to play its role 
both in managing statewide risks and providing leadership and support community to be managing their climate risks as well. Well, when it comes to wax and waning, I know exactly what you're talking about. We're having our own issues here. And, and I'm guessing that a state like California, I, I don't know how much Victoria sort of uh, collaborates with some of the U.S. states, but the U.S. federal government was taking a leadership role until very recently, until a couple of years ago. And now the states are really stepping it up. And it seems like that it's a similar model that y- you guys are pursuing. Are you going to attend the, the big climate action summit in San Francisco? Is Victoria, the state government, going to attend that? Because they're talking a lot about mitigation, but also adaptation. It's going to be in September. Is that an event that you guys are going to be able to send people to? Yeah, we're in discussions on that at the moment. So we haven't taken a final decision, but we're looking at uh, whether and to what extent we can participate, including um, to what extent some of the the industry and community organisations here in Victoria might want to participate as well. And so we're that's. Under active consideration, but no decisions taken yet. Just as an, uh, an American, I, I would encourage you, if you guys do get a chance, just from my own experience talking to a lot of the folks down in Melbourne, you guys are really doing so- sophisticated work. And California is doing some sophisticated work, but I just did a bunch of interviews with them. And in some ways, you guys have surpassed them, and I think they would really benefit from your presence. So there, there's my plug. I know it's a budget issue, but anyway, it would be great to see Victoria there. Yeah, no, we'd, we'd love to be sharing our, our work and we're looking for, and including through conversations like this one, looking for ways to showcase and build an awareness of what Victoria is doing so that it can provide that sort of learning opportunity for others because we do think that the architecture we've established is is genuinely world class and we do want to be able to share the lessons. That said, I will say I used to work in California in the, uh, in a climate change think tank and the sustained activity in California on climate change. I'm more familiar with mitigation than adaptation, but the many years of continued effort has created a whole bunch of lessons that other jur- subnational jurisdictions have learned from as well. So the the learning goes both ways. Well, yes, and in mitigation, California has just been really leading, but I just think they're finally starting to turn their gaze on adaptation the last few mm. years, which it's going to be, I think, a lot of great things happening, but it, it is something still relatively new, so it remains yeah. to be seen. Yeah, well, and I think we have some common challenges there in terms of just like the drying trends and the impacts on agriculture. So there will be some nice opportunities. The the adaptation summit that I attended, how did it meet your expectations? It Was it the sort of event? I know it was sort of at the front end of this larger national conference that NCARF was uh, hosting, but did, were you happy with the results? Yeah, we really were. So our goals going into the Adaptation Sector Summit were to build an awareness across the range of stakeholders with respect to the Climate Change Act and these upcoming requirements for for adaptation action plans across those key systems from 2021. And so kind of letting people know that this is in the pipeline and they're going to have to be involved and get those plans in place. The second was to explore common challenges. So whilst we're moving to this system-based approach, there are some challenges that all systems need to deal with and where we think that uh, there's some collaborative learning opportunities. So some of those key challenges include just engaging with the community on climate change impacts and and how to build resilience. Similarly, um, how to build the resilience of infrastructure in the um, built environment. That's a common challenge across all the different systems. And so we wanted to do those two things, build awareness of the act and explore those common challenges. And in terms of how we went, we got really good engagement, over 100 participants. And the surveys and the um, feedback that we got at the end of the session suggested that we did hit our two goals. So we got certainly strong lift in the level of awareness of the requirements and really positive feedback in terms of the move to this system-based adaptation system. Also, we got some insights in terms of the work that we will need to do, not just to support those individual systems to develop their adaptation action plans, but how to maintain a degree of coordination and connection across them so that that set of plans forms a coherent and complementary whole. I just heard a lot of negative feedback on the keynote speaker. That guy really oh. screwed things up there for you. <laughs> no. 
not the case. Right. Uh, no, just a little dig. So a question about the communication that you're doing for the entire state. And I did not attend all the sessions, but I did look at the agenda. And this is for the NCAF meeting, not the a sector summit. So there's the one-day sector summit that you hosted, but then there was like a three- or four-day um, NCAF, the National Climate Adaptation. Uh, National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility. Thank you. And so that brought together folks from all over Australia. And so what I noticed was there there wasn't a lot of, I guess, emphasis on communicating the issue of adaptation to the broader public. And I and I went through Victoria's adaptation plan relatively, you know, I, I went through all the different pages of it. And maybe you could speak to it. You have a lot of effort dedicated toward engaging with relevant like communities and sectors and all the people that are going to play sort of a formal role. But I didn't necessarily see public engagement to sort of say, we have this issue of adaptation, you know, Victoria is going to have to adapt at a broader level. And maybe I missed it. Maybe you could sort of clarify that. Or is that something that you you feel like you need to do more of? Because that's probably what I'm trying to do with the podcast is that people don't realize what's in store regarding adapting to climate change. And a lot of it's sort of insider technical planner kind of thing. And so what are you doing with that action plan? Hmm. Um, it's a great question, and part of it goes to what are the roles of the different levels of government. And so within Australia, the national government and key institutions like the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO, which is one of our premier uh, scientific research organisations, plays a really important role in the public communication of uh, what climate change is, and how it's already tracking in the Australian landscape and what the outlook is under a range of different uh, scenarios. And so the kind of lead, I'd say, basic science around climate change and its impacts comes out of those sorts of national institutions. That said, um, we see an important role for the state government in that basic public-facing communications and education, and so as part of our climate change work program, we do things like periodic public-facing reports about what climate change means for Victoria, what impacts are already observable and what's likely to unfold over the coming decades. And we do that at the statewide level, but we also do that at a more regionally-based level because often many people are interested in what it means for them and what it means for their local area and their local community. And so at that kind of macro level, we have these you know periodic reports and communication products that we use in a range of our work. Kind of sitting alongside that, we are, through our adaptation program, really trying to equip different sectors, different local governments and different regions with the information and the tools they need to be doing adaptation planning and engaging with their communities at that kind of more practical level. And so rather than just having this sort of abstract conversation about climate change in isolation from, well, what can we do about it? What are the solutions? What are the actions? We're equipping those different groups, whether that's uh, the sector leads or the regional leads or the local councils, with information and tools to be able to have that conversation with their own community and to collectively, through things like adaptation action plans, um, come up with a set of priorities for what they're going to do to be better prepared and to build their resilience so that they can continue to thrive in a climate changed world. In the U.S., we've sort of given up our ability to use public service announcements on TV. We have still a little bit, but when I lived in Australia, I was just so impressed by how many of these public service announcements you would see on TV. And I, I guess I, I, I don't remember if it was state government, federal government, or even local government, but it mm. was it, like there was ones about drunk driving or smoking, and they were just really just effective. And I always thought, you know, if you start talking about climate change, here's a huge opportunity to just talk directly to the people people with these mediums like TV uh, on these bigger issues. And, and, and I guess I, I just don't know if that's a state th- involved with public service announcements. And- yeah, I mean, like some of that happens through state government programs. Some of that happens through national programs and some of it happens through other other players. And so one thing that's um, just 
just been emerging in the last couple of weeks, or although there's been a lot of work leading up to it, is that a couple of our major news organisations, so the public broadcaster, ABC, but also one of the commercial broadcasters, Channel 7, has been working to get a, a basically a, a really simple and accessible and repeat segment about climate change into their weather uh, their weather forecasts and their weather presentations, which is just a standard part of any news broadcast. And so, um, and that's work that's been supported by, it's actually the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation here in Melbourne. And so it doesn't all have to come from state or federal government. A whole range of different players can um, come come together. And this was a collaboration with Monash University, one of our main universities here in Melbourne. They start kicked it off last week and it's likely to become hopefully a weekly or perhaps monthly segment in the TV weather um, report. Oh, excellent. And just, I, I do, I want to commend you in your action plan. There's a section where you, you talk about the different sectors like nonprofit, state government, then local government, about all their different roles in adaptation. And I thought you guys did a really good job sort of like laying out different roles and responsibilities. And that seemed like a nice infrastructure. So to say, now if we're going to do statewide communication to the public, we have the, you know, it all defined here. So uh, it, it was really kind of impressive how you broke it down. But just, uh, you know, one more question here, and I, I want to leave people with some practical advice, and I know how hard it is to engage sometimes with the state government. I used to work for a state government. If someone's out there listening to, especially someone in Australia, and they want to get more involved, they want to learn more, or they actually want to do something, how can they engage the Victoria state government on doing adaptation? And I know it's not as simple as like they're going out in their front yard and doing adaptation, but what would you recommend sort of like a first step? Well, as a first step, I'd say take a look at our website. So pretty sure, I'm just having a look here, but it's climatechange.vic.gov.au. So that's vic.gov.au. Um, and that sets out both our kind of big picture policies, but it's also got some detail, including our current at, um, adaptation plan, and sets out some of the different streams of work that we have running and depending upon what their particular interest is or what region or sector that they operate in, there may well be some nice connection points between their interest and what we're doing. And if there isn't, well, then they can contact us just at, like clicking through on the website and we can connect them with either a local council or a regional group or others who are taking practical action on climate change adaptation in their area of interest. Excellent. And I'll, and I'll include contacts to the, your, your websites on my show notes, too. A lot of people right. use those. Any sort of final thoughts you want to share with my listeners? Oh, well, I mean, it's wonderful to have the opportunity, firstly, to share what we're doing. And secondly, it's great to be able to learn from the experience of other jurisdictions. And so shows like yours, but also collaborations like the partnerships between state and territory governments across the world, which Victoria is also a part of, are really important because one of the big things with adaptation is that there is no perfect approach. It's relatively new and we need to learn by doing. And one of the big themes of feedback in our summit evaluation was people really want case studies. People really want to hear about what people are doing, how it's working, how it's going, what went well, what went badly, so that we can learn from each other's experience and not just have to repeat everyone else's mistakes. So these opportunities to share what we're doing and the opportunity to hear about what others are doing are a really important part of making that possible. Awesome. And thank you again for inviting me down. If you need a follow-up speech, let me know, okay? <laughs> so you're not averse to an occasional trip to the Southern Hemisphere? Well, you know, part of what I was trying to – I was talking with some folks, maybe there's some opportunities actually kind of going out and talking to some people on the ground where, you you know, it would be sort of getting out into some maybe some of the rural areas and some of the urban areas and actually doing an episode like that. So, yeah, keep that in the back of your head too. Mm. So. <laughs> I'll keep it in mind. Yeah. Thank you All so right. much, and thanks for your support for the summit. All right. Thank you. All right. Hey, Adapters. I am back again here at the Melbourne Adaptation Conference. Well, this is the NCOF conference, and it's it's a long acronym, but I am here with... Nina Keith, Senior Strategic Planner at City of Onkaparinga in South Australia. 
Okay, so what do you do in South Australia? I do, personally, or well, your position, my position. So it's a, a role with a really broad scope. I get to do anything to do with climate change adaptation, and I need to have a particular focus on coastal planning, but it's been wonderful because I just get to do whatever I want around adaptation. So our region, right across South Australia, there's all these local government regions that have done adaptation plans for sort of four to five local governments. And um, we had our plan done about four years ago. And so we've been slowly working to embed all those actions in the councils. And we're now up to the stage where we really need to start engaging with the community. And so I'm lucky enough to get to do some really amazing programs with community members around climate adaptation. Did they hire you to do adaptation work when you first started there? Was that the sort of the agenda? You said you're doing it now, but was, okay, we're hiring Nina to come on and do adaptation planning for South Australia, or did it evolve when you got there? Well, what happened, my background was I worked in Melbourne on a program that was looking at water-sensitive urban design, which in Australia is this term that refers to, you know, capturing and treating stormwater in our cities rather than just letting it all flow out and pollute the receiving waterways and bays and using it to irrigate wetlands and, you know, bringing more trees and green space into our urban environment, which has a whole lot of obvious climate benefits. But for years, there's been senior level support for making water sensitive urban design happen. And it just doesn't translate into action. I mean, it's the classic policy implementation gap, you know. So I was involved in a research program at Monash Uni called the National Urban Water Governance Program. And we were looking at, you know, why does this change not happen? And where it does happen, because there were some success stories, we were studying what has enabled that change to happen. And I mean, that is just a subject for a whole whole nother conversation. But it, all of that is to say that I had a background in social sciences and really trying to understand what are the change processes across a big regime that involves lots of different players, lots of different organisations and technology. So, you know, socio-technical change so when I moved to South Australia with, with young babies, I, I just thought this job would be a, you know, like a, a nice, simple job to do, helping to prepare this adaptation plan. So I did that for a year, but they'd asked me to, this was about six years ago, you know, do the brief and um, get a consultant to write the plan. And they just wanted a simple risk assessment or a vulnerability assessment. And I just thought that is not going to... <laughs> promote the change that's required. So I threw that approach out and designed an approach that involved a lot more engagement around what are people's values and what are their attitudes, their behaviours and their level of skill around particular areas. And so really getting as part of the planning process, absolutely understanding what the risks are and the actions that need to be taken, but also as part of that involving decision makers and community members in what they think about those risks and the proposed solutions. And so really having a values-based conversation because we're only going to deal with this if we think it matters. So it sounds like you kind of adjusted in real time to what you thought should be done. Do you feel like with the councils, adaptation is such a a new feel for a lot of groups. Was anyone there to sort of second guess what you wanted to do or did they just give you that flexibility to kind of say, this is what we really need to do? They... They were really open because everyone shares the same frustrations. Nobody wants to prepare a policy that sits on a shelf and gathers dust. You know, we've all done it and it's really frustrating. No one wants to do that again. And so the work that we did at Monash was really well backed up. There's there's work around the, the world now around, you know, transitions work. You know, how do we transition big systems, cities, sectors, to more sustainable practices. And so they were really open and interested. And so they did that. I went off and had another baby. (laughs) And then so I sort of missed the whole planning process, but they absolutely took it on board and the consultants really engaged with that approach. And and then when I came back, you know, we had this great plan and what I saw, which was just so wonderful, was people right across the organisation and in the community had been really well engaged about, around this question of how do we respond to climate change. And while no one necessarily knew the answers, they were, they'd all bought into the problem and this idea of, you know, needing to take action. So, you know, I'm just so pleased with that planning process because 
it now makes my job so much easier when engaging with people around taking action. So, so really, I'm only there a couple of days a week. So I have to be really kind of, you know, catch the opportunities as they come. So some of the projects I'm working on at the moment, for example, we're doing a coastal planning project and under, you know, really drilling down into the coastal risks around climate change. And we've done a amazing 3D computer model of our entire 31 kilometre coastline. But when I saw this little video that had been made using that model, I had a completely emotional response, like my heart just kind of went, whoo. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, surely we can't leave this only in the hands of our coastal planners and engineers. You know, we use it to monitor sea level rise and coastal erosion and we might give it to a consultant to build a, you know, design an intervention like some pylons or a seawall or something. And so I rang the company who'd done the model and they were like, yeah, you can totally make movies out of this. And then we have a film festival, the Flurio Film Festival. And so I rang them and I was like, I've got this thing. (laughs) What could we do with it? What do you think? And so we caught up and they're going to do a climate change theme for 2019. So it's a competitive film festival. And so how it's evolved is filmmakers need to make a film under eight minutes on the theme Climate Change, Hot Topic, Cool Films and City of Onkaparinga will give filmmakers access to the computer model, any of our other data. So, you know, if they're interested in biodiversity or coastal stuff or whatever, we're making that avenues into council, you know, open and available in a way that it's quite tricky otherwise for people you are having a lot of fun with your job you're like you seem like the most fun i've ever met with someone dealing with adaptation you are giving you a lot of flexibility what's the name of the city that you're in again repeat that city of onkaparinga yeah so i mean we've also got so that sort of inspired me and so we also have a contemporary arts program where we have eight artists in residence each year and so we, I did the same with with those guys they have agreed to dedicate two of the artists each year can focus on climate change so again those artists just have this they have a desk in our office in the sustainability team and they can get access to whatever the hell they want around climate change and respond to it artistically so right now we have an artist called Laura Wills and she's done all her work on maps historically and so, you know, climate change and councils, like what better place to source maps? So she's been working with our GIS team, sourcing a whole lot of maps around the local rivers. And I'll be really interested to see the work that she comes up with. Next after her is a guy called Neville Seashon, and he's a photographer. And he's going to document the recovery process of a local community that flooded last year. And they were really badly affected. And, you know, that they're struggling with, they're going to be inundated again. And so their insurance premiums have just gone up, you know, through the roof. Some of them can't afford to pay it. Some are out of their homes a year later. Um, So Neville's going to work with the the community to document that. And then we have another artist after him called Louise Flaherty, who's going to do memorials to lost plants around the city. So each of those get to work with different parts of the council and it's a way for us. So one of one of the sort of instigators for all of this work was we surveyed our community at the end of 2017 and we based it on the CSIRO Community Knowledge Attitudes and Behaviours Survey. And what was really interesting about the results, well, firstly, we put the survey out and, and we have like a panel of demographically selected community members who agree to do surveys for us on anything. And if we get about 100, 200 people, we're super happy. That's a great result. And the survey lady came running over to my desk after she'd launched it and was like, what the hell have you done? Like people were just couldn't get enough of the survey. So we ended up with, um, you know, 630-something respondents. And what was really interesting and surprising to me was that over 80 percent of people believe that they've already experienced the effects of climate change which I like I knew I knew to be true but I didn't know that residents would be putting their experiences into the context of a climate change impact and so and the other thing that was really interesting is regardless of whether residents believed that climate change was human induced or naturally occurring they still wanted city of onkapringa to take at least some action on 
climate change. So over 90% of our residents said, you know, we want you to take a lot of action or a little of action, but they wanted us to take action. So that was great, but none of them had any idea what we were doing. <laughs> and a lot of the comments talked about how despondent people were feeling. You know, it's a very depressing narrative in the mainstream media. You know, it, it's very easy to believe that there's no action being taken. And in fact, there's heaps of action being taken at the local government level. And so we've, yeah, started this whole program of, of community engagement initiatives. And the overwhelming response is people just feeling really relieved, uplifted and motivated because, you know, seeing action being taken is motivating and knowing that you're not alone. So another, sorry, you go. So my listeners in the U.S. who work for local governments and such, I mean, that's just a great story, especially that community engagement that you just got with the surveys. Um, is there things that you have that people can look at? Do you provide resources? Are you capturing it in a way that someone else could kind of replicate the work that you're doing? Yeah, so I'm just in the process of building a website. that It will eventually be resilientsouth.com, but it's not launched yet. Yeah, so that should be soon, probably by the time this is so and that will have yeah links to all kinds of resources other programs that we love work that we're doing and what I really love is we're doing a wall of fame and so that is bringing together stories I'll show it to you later of just everyday people taking action on climate change and talking about how they're being impacted by climate change and I've got all of our staff um, doing it but not having them as you know these sort of corporate bureaucrats but you know I've got them to give me photos of them whatever just being just being real and you know talking about how they take action in in their daily life and so that is just a beautiful resource another initiative we did recently was an event around dealing with heat waves so it's calling feel it it was called feeling hot 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 and we brought together a panel of you know the head of the Bureau of Meteorology in South Australia and the head of the SES and uh, chairwoman from the Red Cross, someone from a homelessness service, um, the police, you know, all of the sort of relevant people that would deal with heat waves. And we took them through a three-week hypothetical heat wave set in 2025. And we just, we worked with the Bureau of Meteorology to make sure that the temperatures were accurate and they were freaky. And this... <laughs> The heat wave just got worse and worse and we hammered the, this panel with, you know, now this is happening, now that's happening, what do you do? And then in the final week the heat wave broke and there were storms and flooding and bushfires, which is all stuff that happens. And, you know, we took the audience through this kind of ordeal that was pretty overwhelming and we had a great facilitator who was a pretty funny woman, Amanda Blair, and and so she, we sort of finished the the scenario, the, the three-week heat wave, and she's like, okay, time for reflections. And when we were preparing it, she's like, you need to write, we're fucked. And um, I, was, I was writing the PowerPoint, and I was like, I don't think that this fits within corporate standards, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. My director was in the audience. But it's how everyone was feeling, so it was completely true. And, you know, and everyone was like, ah, oh, ha, ha, and laughed because it was kind of a relief to laugh. And But then... You know, we had a really amazing session with the panel and, and the audience members talking about what are the things that we can do to mitigate these these challenges and, and the feedback that we really strongly got from that event was what I was saying earlier, that people are just so relieved to see that so much action is being taken. And one of the things I feel really strongly about is that, you know, there, there's incredible work being done and we always forget to share it. And some people think, oh, but, you know, that's a waste of time or that's just bragging or boasting or whatever. It's not. It's it's really important to help people to feel like they're not alone and, and that others are taking action and, and you can build momentum. And we're going to roll that event out because we, we developed up a great package of resources through developing that event. So we worked with our local ABC radio to do fake news announcements, you know, dun, 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 in what is being known as the great heat wave of 2025. And the Bureau made some fake weather outlooks for us and we had stupid sound effects for each of the panellists. And, yeah, it was very fitting having fake news, I thought, at this time. <laughs> 
just a f- kind of final thought here. Uh, we went out to dinner with a group of people the other night, and I just want to mention to my listeners, you, you really hassled me about podcasts, and you, quite f- frankly, you bullied me about what I should be listening to. Can you just share really quickly the biggies that you recommend, the kind of sell-out corporate podcasts that you listen to? All right, I've got lots of favorites. I, I love nearly everything from Gimlet media so that's Alex Bloomberg but I recommend that you start with the very first season of Startup because that tells the whole story of how that company evolved and then you know some of their programs like Reply All oh, well S-Town that's um, This American Life S-Town is amazing and everyone should listen to that Serial obviously and then I love Esther Perel's Where Should We Begin that's sort of relationship therapy and I also love Dear Sugar Radio which is Cheryl Strayed and Steve Almond offering advice on how to live a good life. So your favorite indie podcast, though, what's that one? America Adapts. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Hey, Adapters, and I am with... I'm James Evasquale. I'm from the city of Whittlesea, which is a local government in Victoria. What's that city's name again? City of Whittlesea. Great name. I love that. Okay, so why are you here? I work more broadly in sustainability, but adaptation has been one of the things that's on the cards since I started my role at the city of Whittlesea. And so I've come today to, or to the whole conference, in fact, to just try and wrap my head a little bit more around what we could be doing. So how big is Whittlesea? I mean, what kind of population base are you dealing with? Why does this merit your attention to go be doing adaptation? So Whittlesea is is fairly large, but most importantly, it's actually a growth council. So we're on the outer fringe of of Melbourne and we're one of the fastest growing in the nation. So we have huge amounts of extra population and extra housing being developed all of the time, as well as a large regional area that requires uh, or that relies on agriculture. So what are some of the climate impacts you're thinking about or dealing with? Possibly the the main one that has come up is really heat. Um, We're not coastal, so we don't have any issues with sea level rise. But heat and localised flooding are probably the two, two main ones that people have identified as being key for our area. So are you relating heat to bushfire? Is bushfire an issue? Uh, sorry, yeah, bushfire is a huge issue. The 2009 bushfires that happened in Victoria, uh, one of the focal points for the community was in Whittlesea. It was one of the main relief centres for people coming out of the bushfire area. And so that emergency management and preparedness stuff has been huge in the city of Whittlesea, yeah. So is it mainly a metro area or do you have some kind of suburbs, forested area, anything like that? So it's about two thirds rural and one third urban currently. Uh, like I said, large growth. So that's uh, slowly changing. But yeah, it's largely farmland up in the northern area, but we come into the into foothills. So you do have wooded area up the top, which is where the, the fires really hit, as well as a small township of Whittlesea, which is not actually connected to Melbourne currently. So the reason I ask is I've never asked this question on the podcast before, but are kangaroos going to be able to adapt to climate change? Uh, I think kangaroos are pretty good, actually, to be honest. In terms of kangaroos, they're pretty well populated throughout Australia. They they seem to cope quite well, so I'm sure that they'll be fine. So there are a lot of councils here at, at this meeting, and I, I guess, would you describe councils as being the sort of main tip of the spear dealing with climate change or is state government a bigger player? How does that work here in Australia? Uh, Local governments, so I'm fairly new into this space, but local governments do seem to be really active, particularly in in Victoria. We have greenhouse alliances, which are generally member organisations of groups of councils. Uh, A few of the representatives are here at this conference. So through that, a lot of adaptation has happened within our sort of northern metro area. And I would say that they're, they're very, well, I don't know about ahead of the game, but they're definitely one of the, one of the key ones. The state government currently is doing really well in terms of trying to push adaptation as a discipline. I'm not sure historically how that's been, but they are now. Yeah. Okay. So what's your background? Why are you doing adaptation? Is this something you studied or you're working on for a long time? No, I worked in, uh, in grocery stores selling organic fruit and veg. So I moved into adaptation only about two years ago. It's actually only a small part of my role as well. I do broader policy work. So I trained as a social science uh, undergrad doing policy and environment. And 
I worked in waste for a little bit, uh, so doing waste education mostly and a little bit of contract management and a couple of other councils and then made my way across to Whittlesea and, and into a broader environmental policy role. I want to talk about the podcast a little bit. I, it was always a, you know, a mystery to me at first how I got invited to come down here to be the keynote speaker all the way here in Australia. And you're, you're part of that mystery, right? Could you? I think my listeners would find that fascinating, maybe my international listener base. Yeah, so my partner happens to work in adaptation as well. We never particularly planned that, but she works for the state government and uh, who are the people who are responsible for bringing you out. But one of the reasons that they, I think, even knew that you were a possibility is because I, in efforts to understand what adaptation meant when I first got my role and was told that I was writing an adaptation plan, I did a bit of a Google and came across your podcast. And I have a three-hour daily commute, so I've listened to a fair bit of, of America Adapts. That you don't understand what music to my ears, that whole just story. I did a Google on an adaptation and the podcast showed up and now you're using it as a resource. That's great. And so, but in what way? What, so you are having to do some planning. And so are there particular episodes that were useful to you? Oh, that's interesting. I, it probably helped me more at a conceptual level, sort of understanding of what adaptation might mean and what it might mean for a local government. Not necessarily because there was a podcast about local government adaptation, but just because I started to get a feel about what different people meant by adaptation, what what sort of solutions might be out there, or not solutions, but approaches might be out there, which really just helped catalyze my thinking about what is a local government's responsibility towards adaptation and where should we be focusing Yeah. Okay, so what are some blind spots for America Adapts that you sit there and you're doing the job that you're doing? What kind of guests could I have on that would help you do your job better? Look, practitioners who are running projects are always really good. Local governments are obviously generally very close to the community. Uh, and so particularly stuff that's working with with like social services style sectors and directly with community groups, they, that would be a, a, a major one. You know, I, I get thrown from project to project. So at the moment, I'm working on biodiversity. And so there's obviously a huge amount of resource within your podcast around that sort of natural resource management end. When I first started listening, it was very heavily focused on natural resource management. So it's a little bit of go in my head. I'm, you know, may have to go back and listen to some of them again, but I'm sure that that will, you know, that will hopefully influence. It's not necessarily me working directly on adaptation, but hopefully influence what we're doing with the biodiversity work as well. I haven't done this with any of the people I've spoke to so far here, but as you probably picked up on occasion, I ask a guest to give me their 15, 30 second adaptation elevator speech. And so you're city council and you're talking to the, the public. How would you do your adaptation elevator speech? All right, you're, you're on. Okay, I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about this, but come on. Is this so direct to the public or to the council? Sorry. Why don't we do both? You know, here's the council, which is a little bit different audience, but you're at a, a cricket match and someone, the cricket, someone's in the middle of winning a cricket match and it's not. I know. The inside joke there is you never know when someone's winning a cricket match at any given point. You have to wait till the end. As an aside, okay, let's start off with the council. So actually, I did this when talking about adaptation to the council, and I really focused on the human element. So my pitch was, here is here is my... You're not giving me your pitch. Give me your pitch to that council. You're <laughs> describing what your pitch is. All right. Here's Margaret and Charlie. They're two members of our community. They're in their mid-60s and they live in the outer suburbs of Melbourne. And here is how they're going to be affected. So they are going to experience far more heat stress. They're going to be way more reliant on their air conditioning, if nothing else. They're, and so on and so on. I won't give you the whole pitch, but that was I, the main aim in my pitch is to really try and focus it on how it will impact directly on residents within the municipality. And so that would probably go if I was doing a pitch to the community as well. It would be really focused. Hold on, no, I, we're going to shift. I want you really to think about this, though. Like, it, <laughs> you, this is the public. I want you to think blue collar. You are waiting in line at the bathroom a, at an AFL championship match, and you're surrounded by these big blokes. <laughs> and you have to give your adaptation elevator speech, what would you say to them? I would say, do you realize that it's costing you a huge amount of money that you're not doing things to adapt to climate change? I can point to any number of things, including your air conditioning bill, that adapting to climate change would actually help. I think you're probably going to get a beer on the head, <laughs> but that's all right. That was pretty simple. All right. Any final thoughts? 
Uh, no, just have a good time. <laughs> Spoken like a true Aussie. Thank you so much. <laughs> Too easy. Hey, Adapters, I am back here with... Rowan Hamden. I work for a company called XDI, the Cross Dependency Initiative. Okay, quickly summarize, what do you guys do? We uh, do deep data analytics, integrating climate change information and historical weather hazard with very specific information about assets, houses, water treatment plants, roads, poles, power lines, and work out specifically what will fail and why under climate change and under historical weather, uh, so that people who need to manage or invest in these assets understand exactly when they need to spend money to keep them resilient and how much it's going to cost. There actually aren't a lot of private companies at this conference, and so here you're here. Why did you prioritize coming here? I mean, it's, it might sound obvious, but you, yeah, you're yeah. here. Ah, uh, look, yeah, no, no. Actually, I was surprised because normally, look, I've been, I've probably been to every one of these conferences in different guises, and this one, yeah, we came in and it was just, um, we're the only private, and it was like, okay, well, that's really interesting, and it, and it shows. I think it shows the underinvestment in Australia in the sector. Like, there's less excitement about where the sector's going and where the opportunities are. But then on the flip side, I mean, we're in that business where actually we're a very mature provider. We're way past the stage where companies are offering planning solutions or talking about or engagement on the topic of climate change within an institution. We're actually in that deep, deep decision-making stage where, where there are companies who are ready to think about exactly what climate change means, how they need to invest to, to achieve resilience and, and continue to live services into the future. And so I think we're here because we are that next tier of understanding and we're, and we're working with a far more sophisticated layer of clients that have emerged over the years as our understanding of climate change has increased. What you do is quite technical, as, as you sort of explained, yeah, yeah, even pre- and. I'm thinking a, a lot of your clients, especially the, the folks that are really just addressing adaptation now are government entities, the private sector, yeah. still catching up. So are your clients local governments? Yeah. No, look, okay. So I think we've got a tagline and the tagline is, you know, um, we turn climate change into investable decisions. And I think that's the key point. We, we look for those who are actually having to spend money to keep their infrastructure running or in investing in infrastructure to... Um, you know, to keep it uh, and, not, and want to figure out where climate's going, how they need to make their services resilient. Look, we started with water utilities and we're working with them, like, you know, the people supplying water and dealing with sewerage and stuff. But we've grown, you know, to uh, encompass all types of infrastructure and even even working out where, you know, if, if you're a water pumping station and a power supply goes out, uh, how do you know which power supplies are resilient or not? They're not even in your company. You know, you have no control of them. So we, can, so we really do with this cross-dependency really well. Look, in the last year, we're starting to see quite a significant number of corporate clients. The level of analysis we're able to do is actually is genuinely investable. So if you've got a portfolio asset risk of, you know, a million houses or a, a bunch of buildings or investments across a geographic geography, we can analyse them and tell them when when they're likely to have failure events, when they're, what's their investable opportunities, what you need to fix and that increasingly we're seeing more and more clients coming from the financial sector we've been approached by a couple of the ratings agencies they're looking at understanding how to classify country and state level debt by rating whether they're doing enough about climate change and they lacked the metric, a tool, to understand whether they could do that. So they approached us and said, OK, so can we be the basis of the rating system so that they can actually say they think, you know, the government of New South Wales is doing enough, so we're not going to drop their... We're not going to drop their debt rating and cause them to pay more money to get money into the account. They used the classic example of uh, New Orleans and New York. Both of them had a hurricane. Both of them were devastated. New York bounces back, just gets on, business as usual, makes its infrastructure resilient, gets ready for the network. network uh, the next one, New Orleans, still struggling on, you know, what, nearly a decade later? Uh, for them, that's like a clear trigger about who's prepared for climate change and who isn't and whether they need to be factoring that into a country or region's credit rating. So I, my own experience with national government, state governments, there's a lot of really complex tools coming out with adaptation and sometimes these government entities might not even have the sophistication to know what they need. Yeah, sure. So is, is that an issue for your company as you kind of, yeah. as you try to explain how this can be useful to you? Sometimes your potential client doesn't even know, and, and I'm not trying to diss a local government, but you know how it is. There's a lot of policy people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe a water agency has some really, you know, they have engineers and such, but is that an issue even articulating 
this is the future. Yeah. Look, I'd say, look, it takes... It takes a company that's been on the climate change journey for a few years to figure out they're not getting enough from standard planning methodologies. Look, they're getting to understand some of their broader risks, they know where their exposures are, but when it comes time to understand where to spend every dollar at the optimal rate, they realise there's a big gap in the current way of doing things, and that's the gap we've built. And so we're actually, we really, really are seeing it more and more now because companies have been doing this for, what, five, ten years. You know, progressive ones have been in this space for a while and they're now arriving at the journey where they're realising they're, they're still not getting enough to make the investable decisions they need to make. And so, that's, so we are seeing some relatively rapid growth this year as these companies come on stream. But there's still, you know, I, th- I suppose our frustration is... You know, there's still plenty of institutions that are only just starting the journey and we'd wish they'd leapfrog. Why go through the um, these sort of slower, more methodical planning processes that all their predecessors did to only arrive to realise they still don't have enough money to make it, enough information to make a decision? And we're trying to say, look, the computing power's there now, the data's there now, we can run the analytics. We can, you can actually get really deep, detailed, investable decision-making information now rather than have to go through a step-by-step process of risk management and planning and scenario analysis. Okay, so final question here. Any favorite session, even if it's not related to what you're doing here? Oh, look, I love all of the behavior change stuff and all the economics of behavior change because at the end of the day, we're people. We've got emotions and we make emotional decisions and... You really understand the complexity of an existential risk like climate change and how our own psychology interacts with that. And it's still such a factor in how we see the world and how we think about climate change and what we do about it. And, you know, and I suppose what we do is just try and make it more real and try and bring it home in dollars and cents terms. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Hey, Adapters, we'll be right back with the second part of Victoria Rising, but I want to share again, legendary Academy Award-winning director Oliver Stone is back with Nuclear Now, his first film in seven years, coming exclusively to theaters across the USA and Canada beginning April 28th. Based on the book A Bright Future, written by award-winning scholar of international relations, Professor Joshua S. Goldstein, who also co-wrote the film, Nuclear Now explores the possibility for the global community to overcome the challenges of climate change and energy poverty to reach a more optimistic future through the power of nuclear energy, an option that may become increasingly important in the critical years ahead. With unprecedented access to the nuclear industry in France, Russia, and the United States, director Oliver Stone delivers a revolutionary documentary that Variety has called an intensely compelling must-see film. The movie opens in New York and Los Angeles on April 28th with special one-day screening events across North America on Nuclear Now Day, May 1st, that you won't want to miss. Visit NuclearNowFilm.com to learn more. All right, let's get back to part two of Victoria Rising. Hey, Adapters, and it is a very special occasion. I am in person with Australia Adapts host, Johanna Nalau. Johanna, it's great to meet you in person. It is great to see you in person. You're taller than I thought, and I look younger than you thought, so well, good. Yeah, when I first saw you, I mean, I've seen your picture a bunch, and I think we've Skyped before with video. But yeah, I'm like, oh, that's you. You looked a bit different in person. But uh, why are you here at this conference? For for a number of reasons. I like to come to the national conferences to check up what's happening in the adaptation space. But also, I I chaired a panel that had amazing members um, on communicating adaptation and very lively discussion about the challenges we face, how we communicate adaptation. And there were some comments about PowerPoints. <laughs> Who made the comments about PowerPoints? I think it was a uh, host of uh, America Dabs, this very well-known figure in the podcasting world. Well, you know, that's good. I wasn't going to bring that up, that panel. So I was on the panel that Joanna was chairing. And so what, besides the PowerPoint, what were some of your takeaways from that panel? I thought it was quite good. It was a full room, you know? We actually had a full room. Yeah, no, no, I thought that was very good. And we did flip mode where we actually asked questions from the audience and engaged them as well. So I think the main points that were coming through, we fail, you know, we discuss how, how you fail at communication. So there were some really good examples of understanding your audience, not being ready. But I think one of the main points for me from that panel was basically that we shouldn't be always so scared about talk about science and we should just you know be confident and not people are always going to argue either for or against or whether climate change is there or not but you know with adaptation I think we have a really good opportunity first of all understanding what the audience is and what their needs are and and kind of testing some of the communication different novel communication methods for instance in conferences like this so 
that's really I really like that idea. So instead of going to stakeholders or communities and you know trying to engage them in adaptation, we should be engaging ourselves first in this kind of venues and see what's actually working and what makes people tick. All right, I'm pivoting here. So we're down in Victoria. What do you know about adaptation in the state of Victoria? Do you have any opinion whatsoever? What are they doing down here? Are they doing good work? I'm putting you on the spot. So I personally haven't worked with the government in Victoria, but I know people who have, and they are actually very on the front line on when it comes to adaptation policy. So they're very strong on putting policy frameworks in place, also understanding what the adaptation governance looks like. And that's one of the kind of more novel aspects of adaptation that we don't usually think about. So how do you measure how well you're doing an adaptation that relates to a lot of choosing indicators and actually starting to track and understand where you stand and how, you know, you can year by year then then track that progress. And hopefully I get to, I know a few people here at the conference that are from the Victorian government, so I'm hoping to have a bit of a chat with them what's what's happening. Okay, I think people are wanting us to get right to it. What, what's happening with Australia DAPS? You, you had two episodes and you and I talked about three episodes. <laughs> She's correcting me here. She's, three. Oh, it's been a while. And that's partly me just talking with you about what are the next steps with it. But what's the plan? I think, you know, your, your fans, especially now that I'm here in Melbourne, I've heard it talked about a bit. What, what's up next? Well, what's up? So I did three episodes and then I did record the fourth and the fifth one. But there were some delays in the production manager roles, tasks. Um, anyway, so we do have those and I've talked to um, a few people that I really would like to interview for Australia. So it is kicking off again. So I'm hoping to get some of the episodes out fairly soon. On whether, whatever format that is. The only delay is on your end. You can publish them whenever you want. And people, I'm encouraging Johanna that let's spin off Ultra Straight Adapts. It has more than enough content to do on its own. And I think it should stand alone. And so that's, she's just needling me here. And I deserve a bit of that. But people want that published date when you're spinning off. Give me a date. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a day because I will be leaving fairly, fairly short to conferences in Europe and South Africa. But I'm hoping that I could get my act together and get the fourth uh, episode online before that. So that would be before early June is a, is a time, not a date, but somewhere there. All right. A couple of final questions here. You know, I, I'm trying... I'm going around interviewing people and just, you're a Finnish woman here in Australia, talk doing Australian adaptation. You do a lot of international stuff too, but what's really unique about adaptation in Australia? I haven't quite figured it out yet. You know, there's a lot of similarities of the tools and such, but do you have any kind of sense? I mean, do you know enough about the North American scene? What's your opinion? What's unique about adaptation in Australia? Well, I think, and it comes down to actually to the episode three, where I just get discuss with the director for NCAF on kind of the challenges so we do both feel that often when we go overseas so we go to Europe or, or US and so a lot of the discussion is like oh in 30 or 40 years you know this might happen we might have more bushfires or we might have more you know intensive cyclones we you know this could happen so it's very much future focused and putting policies in place whereas Australia is like yeah uh, another Thursday you know <laughs> with the impacts that we are already seeing um, especially in today's session, there was a discussion on Great Barrier Reef and, and the people there are actually already seeing, you know, some of the impacts and they are really concerned and they are now starting to ask, well, what can we do? So I think that's very unique about Australia that we are already facing all of the challenges just like in the Pacific Islands. Um, so it is kind of being at the, at the front line, definitely. You know what it just occurred to me too is that when I worked here, I forgot how... I guess powerful the councils are. There's the councils have a lot of funding and there's a lot more integration, I think, with the state. The federal government, it sounds like it's a little off a bit, but the government is so big here, for better or for worse, but uh just the councils are very they they cover a lot of ground. And I think that that's pretty good actually. You got a lot of people who are thinking about this. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean but it's, yeah, because Australia is, so we have the federal government, we have also each state has the government, but the local governments are not recognised in the constitution. So that means that a lot of the times they are being at the moment given kind of adaptation responsibilities, but then they don't always have the legal power even to make those decisions. So there's a bit of disconnect there. Um, but especially 
you know, some of the state governments. So we're seeing Victoria, um, this movement in Queensland, New South Wales. So there is definitely at the state level as well, you know, they are trying to set kind of statewide policies. And there's well, lots of local governments have gone really active. And some of them, you know, are part of ICLE, this um, kind of global networks and getting support that way. So I think a lot of, I mean, the implementation, where that's where really the real work and adaptation will happen. And that is really local governments. Okay, thanks. And it's so great to meet you in person. Likewise. Okay, hey, adapters. Prince and I am with... John Dool, Manager of Environmental Services for Kingborough Council in southern Tasmania. Okay, so it's a little bit of background. What, what's Tasmania like? What, 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 do, what is it all about for my listeners from all over the world? Well, Tasmania is just a small island state south of Australia, population of about half a million, distributed over magnificent natural environment and a number of dying industries like forestry and things like that so really focused on tourism and ecotourism now. How are the koalas doing? Wasn't there a huge disease issue or something? No, we no, Tasmanian, not devil. Tasmanian devils, that's right. We're getting there. It's been a massive impact, a, a real shock that that kind of disease can spread in the way it has. But it's led to a huge increase in um, dead animals around the place because they did the cleaning up. So it's had a massive impact on the ecosystem down there. So why are you here at an adaptation conference? Why You work for a, a city council. Why is this conference important to you? Well, we're our, our local government is still small in Tasmania, so I really try and focus on community-based impacts of climate change and cr- trying to come up with potential adaptation options and explaining these two to people and trying to work through the feasibility of actually responding. But so what are the issues of climate change in Tasmania? What are you adapting to? Well, the most prominent one immediately is fire, uh, wildfire, which really that's just a community resilience and messaging because that is coming and will only get worse. But the incremental one is our coasts. We have a lot of coastline in Kingborough, a lot of storm surge issues, coastal erosion issues. So trying to work out how we might respond to that and how we might prioritise. Okay, so you're on a panel or you're doing a presentation a bit later on. Uh, What's the name of that panel and what are you going to be talking about? I think it's adaptation from a community-based perspective and a practitioner's point of view. So really, I'm I'm trying to emphasise the bottom approach to the issues. A lot of science at this kind of forum, but really trying to work out how it might impact on the community and what we might do about that. What are, I guess, some of the work that you're doing with stakeholders? How is this important to them in, in Tasmania? I mean, the council obviously plays a big role, but who else are sort of the prominent players in Tasmania? Well, I mean, obviously we have, a, we have very good science in Tasmania. The University of Tasmania has been very prominent on climate science and we have a big presence of CSIRO there. So we have access to really world-class science, but it's how that is communicated to the community and how we get a realistic understanding of the risks from inundation, for example, coastal inundation, and the marrying in of increases in flood risk and storm surge, sea level rise, and the mapping of that down to a fine level to show the community how it will actually impact on them as a community and how we might be able to respond. So if you're walking to a pub in Tasmania and you start talking about climate change, you start talking about adaptation, do you think your average Tassie would sort of understand it or appreciate what's going on or is this sort of still kind of behind the scenes issue? I think they would, but it's difficult because the media and the other levels of government haven't responded to the same extent. So it has largely fallen off the radar, but our approach has led us to be able to discuss it in terms of how they might understand this is what you like about this community. But our modelling indicates that in the future, this beach will be lost or potentially lost. These houses will be inundated. How do you feel about that? What if we work out what is an acceptable way to respond to that? So I think we have the tools to be able to explain it in the way people will actually understand and engage in. Okay, last question. In Tasmania, what's the most popular form of rugby down there? Australian rules. And then what, what's the other one? What's the other no, one? Aus- Aus- they're very keen on Australian rules, but they don't have their own team. And that's always been a running sore. We supply a lot of players to the rest of Australia and we don't have our own team. So any, they talk about that in the pubs, I can tell you. So well, who, who do you root? Well, you don't say root down here. Root no, means no, no, something no, no, else. No, <laughs> who do you support? Is it a Melbourne team that Tazis have to get behind? There's a couple of Melbourne teams that come down to Tasmania for a few games a year, but I'm a Geelong supporter because that's where I come from. So uh, I just keep that quiet when I'm down there, though. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Hey, adapters, I am 
backed with the the lead of the conference? Okay, so my name's Jean Politikov, and I'm the director of something called the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, which everybody calls NCARF, and this is our conference. So how many conferences have you guys had so far? You're, you're a relatively new organization, right? Sort of, I mean relatively speaking. So we were set up in 2008 and I think this is conference number six. So we've been running them pretty much every two years. Uh, the very first one, which we did in 2010, was really had the goal of trying to establish NCAF on the world scene. So we ran it as a big international conference. We had, I think, 1,100 people there, and they came from all over the world. Since then, we've been running it as a national series. But actually, the 2010 conference did lead to a series of international conferences and I think number five in that international series is in Cape Town next month. What really is your purpose with the conference? So if it's a national level conference, is it just mainly targeted adaptation professionals in various sectors? Or what, do you, what do you hope to accomplish? I think particularly here in Australia, the conference has an important role to play in pulling together the rather disparate adaptation communities that are scattered across the country. So Australia has three tiers of government. It has the federal, it has the states and territories, and then it has local government. And many of the things that are done around adaptation, for example, uh, coastal planning and um, infrastructure management, are handled at the state level, which means that adaptation tends to take place in pockets. And because there are only 24 or 25 million Australians and they're scattered across an area which is the size of Western Europe, it's actually... It's a tyranny of geography. It's actually quite difficult for them to build strong networks and to link together to understand what other people are doing and to learn from the experiences of others. So a strong uh, role for this conference is that it takes place at the national level and it pulls together all the different communities in adaptation from the private sector, the public sector, from universities, from industry and business. And it gives them an opportunity every two years to build networks build capacity, learn what others are doing, and just build their experiences and knowledge. So NCAF, I guess, gets some federal funding, but as with the United States, the federal government is more of a roller coaster when it comes to national adaptation issues, whereas the states and local governments, I guess, are a bit more consistent, like, we're going to keep doing this. I mean, is that similar here in Australia, that it's more of a roller coaster from the federal perspective? Is it, And are they a major source of funding? The federal government have been a major source of f funding in the past. The federal government has a rather troubled relationship with climate change, I think you'd have to say. When I came to Australia in 2008, there was a very strong push to build a, a climate change community in Australia. Australia and to establish Australia on the world stage as a prime mover around action to address climate change. That initiative has, I would say, virtually entirely, it has entirely disappeared. So uh, Australia, I think you would have to say, is doing the bare minimum to fulfil its international obligations around treaties like the Paris Agreement at the present time. And that feeds through into our funding. So in 2008, when NCAF was established, all its funding came from the federal government. At the present time, we have a small amount of money from the federal government that will cease at the end of June. And it's not clear what will happen following the 30th of June this year. It looks like we may pick up some more funding from the federal government, but it will be grant-based, project-based, rather than the block funding that we've had in the past from the federal government, where we've had much more freedom to indulge in, in capacity building and network building and generally building an adaptation community in Australia. We're going to move from that model to one which is much more research-based and project-based. Just a couple more questions. So in the United States, we have a national adaptation forum. I don't, don't know if you've ever been able to attend one of those. I think they've had three of those. I've been to two. 
And they first started off, it, it seemed like it really just attracted kind of natural resource professionals, but the organizers have made a huge attempts to diversify that, you know, landscape architects. And, but I think a, an area that they still struggle with, and I think they're probably going to do better next year, is getting private corporate interests to attend these meetings. Usually it's nonprofit and government are showing up. I mean, is, is that similar for you? Do you feel like you have good corporate participation? No, I so if you looked at the programs that we've put on, you would see a, a similar sort of intellectual shift. That uh, In the first conferences, there was quite a big emphasis on ecosystems and ecosystem-based adaptation. And over time, although that still appears on the program, you, you have much more about private sector, about finance, infrastructure, uh, banking, insurance. People have developed much more of an interest in that and also around communication and, and how to persuade communities about the necessity for adaptation. So there has been a shift over time in thinking about the people who attend the conference. Back in 2010, it would been, have been very much people coming from the research community, uh, working in universities and CSIRO, which is a government-based uh, research institution. Over time, that has shifted. So at the moment, we're about 50% research, 50% what you'd call practice. But the emphasis in the practice side is government. So it's a lot of local councils, a lot of consultants who work with local councils, also uh, state and territory representatives and a handful of people from the federal government. There are a few people from the private sector. They are mainly consultants, but there are also a couple. I've seen someone from uh, housing development here. But they're in a minority, a, a very strong minority. Okay, so you've been attending this for a while and you've been in the field for a while. I mean, when you come to this, these conferences, is there anything you saw at this conference that has surprised you or you're encouraged by? I mean, any sort of on the ground work that you like generally have been surprised by and encouraged by? To an extent, my capacity to be surprised is limited by the program that we've built. So you build a program and you invite the people to address what you've built into the program. And so you limit your capacity to be surprised by doing exactly that. Uh, but of course, there are the parallel sessions where people come forward with their own abstracts. And I haven't gone to enough of those yet to understand quite what's happening at the grassroots. And I must do a little bit more of that. I was pleasantly surprised by some of the plenary pres uh, presentations. I think they've been really powerful this time. Uh, I enjoyed the ones this morning from the banking and insurance sector. I was pleasantly surprised by that because I expected to be bored by what they would have to tell me. And I thought they were much more excited themselves by what they're doing rather than what I had perhaps thought was more of a box-ticking exercise that they were indulging in. And I thought, I don't know if you went to hear the uh, presentation yesterday by the chief scientist from uh, Grumpa, but for me that made the whole conference worthwhile. I thought that was a star presentation. I think I missed it. I was then out interviewing, <laughs> darn it. I mean, I really missed quite a it bit. so good. And yeah. we're not, they're, not, they're not being captured on video or anything, are they? Like uh, Some of them will be. That, may, oh, okay. that may well have been captured on video. I mean, he did a brilliant job. It was a, a very technically competent presentation. But also what was exciting about it is if you read the newspapers about the Great Barrier Reef and you care about the environment, it can render you quite suicidal because what the media are telling you is the Great Barrier Reef is doomed and uh, you know it only has a very short time to live and if you want your children to see it, you should take them right now. And he was able to give a presentation. It was very measured. So he said, you know, if the warming is four degrees or five degrees, everything that we are doing is pointless because the reef is lost. But if we suppose that warming can be limited to two degrees or even better, 1.5 degrees, then what we are doing will lead to the sustainability of an ecologically diverse and healthy reef. So I thought that was a great message. 
Wow, fantastic. Well, a- a- any final thoughts? And so you're going to the Adaptation Futures Conference, and there'll hopefully be some water there for you to consume. You know, I think that solved that. But uh, is there any interest in going to the National Adaptation Forum in the U.S.? Do you, have you been in contact with those organizers ever? So I keep a careful eye on the National Adaptation Forum and, and where it's going to be held, and it is my ambition to get there. I would really like to understand better what is understand, what is happening in the United States. Yeah. Well, I know, I know the organizer, Laura Hansen, very well. And any way I could even put you guys in touch, I'm sure she'd love to kind of get it that Australian perspective. So I think that'd be oh, great. If you want to talk on the Australian perspective, I would be delighted you, to give it. <laughs> right, right. You would describe to them. It's going to be in yes. Madison, Wisconsin, I think, this in, next spring. So. Okay, not the most exciting location in, Australia, <laughs> in America, but fair enough. I could make it to Madison, Wisconsin. You hear that, Laura? Uh, not exciting. We with Seattle, you know, Denver or something. Right, right that's a good one. <laughs> they try to put it in the, somewhere in the middle. It was in Minnesota last year, and so they, the people flying. I think that's the goal in public transit. But you know, it would be great if it's at Yellowstone or something, right? Yes, it would. But okay, Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Hey, Adapters, we are back. It is lunchtime at the conference, and I am with... Judy Turnbull from Sustainably. And Fabian Sack, also from Sustainably. Okay, so great name. Are you a private firm, a non-profit organization? We're a private firm. We've been here around for about five years. Okay, so I think that's interesting because I've been interviewing a lot of folks, and most folks here are government, maybe a little bit of non-profit. And so why are you here as a private firm? We have an uh, ongoing interest in uh, climate change adaptation. Our special skill is in climate change adaptation training. Okay, well, I guess give me a little bit more background. You have this skill set. What do you train in? What are you actually pe- training people to do? Well, our latest uh, training offering is a accredited training. It's a certificate four, which is a vocational uh, qualification in the Australian system in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And so it moves from climate modelling right through to incident management. So understanding the modelling right through to when the uh, cyclone hits and what do you do and all the planning and community engagement activities in between those two things. Okay, that's very interesting. So you, you have a training and there's actual certification, but who's the vesting authority that certifies whatever? Uh, the vocational authority in this, within Australia has it, so they're the ones that provide the certificates, and then we also involve all the experts on the ground that are useful in providing this training, so we get subject matter experts in. So someone can get a vocational certification in adaptation here in Australia? Yes, that's right. Well... It's an Australian qualification. So far, we've delivered it delivered in Tonga, which is a small island nation uh, in the Pacific, and that's, that was a sort of our pilot. And we had a whole bunch of people working with us. We brought in CSIRO. I, I suspect you've already talked to some people from CSIRO and UTS, uh, one of the big universities here, and some independent experts also coming to help us deliver the content and to government. It's a growing field adaptation. In the U.S., the private sector is kind of just figuring out what they're going to do. Do you feel at the moment in Australia, you're private, you're obviously always looking for funding and jobs, and is it a great time, or do you feel like people are not prioritizing and funding adaptation like they should? And that's almost like a leading question. Of course they're not <laughs> funding. <laughs> uh, certainly a leading question. You were this, uh, this conference probably left you in no doubt about that. There's a precipitous plunge in funding around adaptation in Australia at the moment due to the sort of a range of political factors. We, uh, we I suppose we're a values-driven organisation, so we, we've got a sort of commitment to sustainability and to skills for sustainability in particular, so we're kind of plugging on. I suppose in the hope that I think there's, a, there's green shoots, and I think, I think there's some indication of green shoots uh, coming around in the conversations I've had today. Okay, in the U.S., it's, again, a merging field, and there's a couple associations, like an American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Is there equivalent of an adaptation society in Australia? The only society that would come close enough is the EIANZ, I guess, the Australian Environmental Institute of New Zealand. It's the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand, so I'm a, I'm a long-term member of them, and I suppose that's how my interest in adaptation sort of is, is, it was sparked. We did as an institute, so it's a voluntary uh, organisation representing about 2,000 environmental practitioners in Australia. It's had a long-standing interest in adaptation, and 
uh, through that, we started off doing conferences and uh, uh, refined, uh, refined that down into this training product eventually. Do you have a personal opinion on this? Because in the U.S. and with you know that group, uh, ASAP, is there a need to create a cer- certification process for adaptation professionals? And I come on both sides. I'm like, well, yeah, because it shows that you're becoming a legitimate area. But there's such diversity into it. You know, it's not like you're getting a certification in plumbing. And so, I mean, do you have an opinion on should there be a, a universal certification around adaptation? It's a very interesting question. So, as I said, I'm a member of the INZ here. I'm also a member of the International Society of Sustainability Professionals, which is actually US-based, um, and that's more a uh, broad organisation. Similar, the EINZ is a very broad organisation. I think there's some value in keeping those broad organisations rather than trying to uh, having lots and lots of small professional bodies, just in terms of combined capacity and uh, f- the flexibility to move as agendas change. I do think there's a conflict between sustainability, like you, there's a sustainability officer, you know, those that's a very common thing. It's different than adaptation and i just wonder if you know if you lump everyone together you're you're lumping the issues together and i think there's potential threat for doing that well i was going to take a more practical uh, approach to your question and that is when we look back at that qualification we just discussed uh, the important thing within vocational education is you have this qualification climate change adaptation but you can contextualize it so you look at your learners and you look at what it is that they wish to know. So in our case, we, we looked at Tonga, what it was they wished to know. We brought in disaster risk management. So in that respect, it's a broad qualification, but we, we narrowed the delivery to what it is that people w- wish to know about. And you can do that within a vocational education qualification is contextualise the learning. So my listeners, I have a lot of young listeners too, and they ask, how can they get into the adaptation universe? And quite frankly, I, it's this is a new one, vocational, and that... I think is a maturing sign of a field because you want to get practical, but that's, I don't sense much of that in the States as with everything it might exist, but I've just haven't heard much about it, but people are looking more to the universities, a four year degree or master's degree in adaptation. And so are you seeing that kind of curricula and those kind of programs showing up in Australian universities? Certainly there's, uh, there's programs in adaptation at many universities in, in Australia. I suppose the beauty of a vocational qualification is it's short and practically orientated. It's not an academic qualification. It's uh, trying to give you practical skills in adaptation. Okay, where are you guys coming from? What city are you from? Sydney. Lovely city. So lovelier than Melbourne? Oh, I was born in Melbourne, so I'm going to sit on the fence. <laughs> There's nothing quite like walking around the opera house, though. There's a certain glow to the universe when you're walking around that harbour, so sunset so yeah any final thoughts no i think uh, it's great to see what you're doing and i think we all need to keep plugging away at the adaptation uh, agenda thank you so much thank you very much hey adapters we are back at the conference and i'm with a fellow american hi i'm hallie aiken i'm an associate professor at the school of sustainability in arizona state university so what brought you all the way over here to australia I was invited to be a speaker in one of the uh, plenary sessions here. I've always been a great admirer of a lot of the work of CSIRO and um, particularly in adaptation planning. Yeah, this was a great opportunity for me to see what's going on in Australia and catch up with colleagues. Not a hard sell to come down to Australia, is it? (laughs) So what exactly is your research back at Arizona State? I actually focus mainly in Latin America. Uh, most of my work has been in Mexico, a little bit in, in uh, Central America, looking at farming and agriculture adaptation to multiple stressors, including climate. Right now I'm working in Mexico City on flood risk and water scarcity. Well, you probably get your finger on the pulse of just even adaptation going on in the United States, independent of your overseas work. Is there anything that stands out about what they're doing here in Australia that's different or similar to the adaptation we're doing domestically in the U.S.? While I'm not like completely familiar with all that's going on in the U.S., um, what does strike me here is that there is a lot of attention uh, to adaptation at the local level, uh, state uh, management and planning, a lot of instruments, involvement of the private sector in providing tools, decision support. Um, I think the the agencies, the kind of federal agencies here or that have national agencies that are supporting adaptation while they complain of declining funding, I think um, their, their existence uh, actually does quite a bit to provide support um, in local level uh, administration. So that, I think, is a little bit different. We don't seem to have 
the same kind of national support uh, and attention to uh, climate change adaptation that you see here. And then listeners, if you're hearing that bell in the background, it's because they're asking us to go to our next session. <laughs> That's quite... Okay, so we were on a communication panel yesterday. Any sort of take-home thoughts from our participation in that? I mean, I had a lot of fun on it, but anything that you uh, took home from that conversation? I think um, some of the, the challenges are similar here in Australia. It seems that people are struggling, particularly on the mitigation side, of just how do you communicate the importance and the severity of climate change to skeptical audiences. But I also think there was some sort of, uh, maybe not consensus, but but a, a general opinion that you know while that's important, there are a lot of work to be done with communities who are interested and motivated, but perhaps just need more information, a lot of more uh, you know accessible information, how to communicate to different audiences, meet them where they are, package the information in ways that are useful for them. So I think there seems to be a general acknowledgement of uh, the challenge, but also that this is something that we can we can manage as a science community. Okay, I think this last question, I'm going to diverge a little bit. I have quite a few younger listeners, and a lot of them are interested in getting into adaptation, being an adaptation professional. There actually aren't Many, or in fact, it's just a handful of like, is there a master's degree in adaptation? Is there an undergrad degree? Arizona State, I mean, how would you sort of mentor someone who wants to get into adaptation? Is it, is it really just a course options now, or do you feel like universities are really kind of starting to offer those kind of programs? I think we have to think about adaptation as we think about most uh, decision making issues. So I think uh, learning about psychology, cognitive issues in decision making, public policy, public administration, thinking about, um, we teach sustainability science, which is a lot about uh, incorporating futures into the present and trying to understand how to think strategically about uncertainty in the future. All of that in general applies to the specific problem of adaptation. And I would almost argue that um, it might be better to keep your options open, um, draw from a variety of disciplines and fields rather than focusing explicitly on climate change as a science or a a, a field of study. Last question. You're based in Phoenix, and I'm moving to Tucson very soon. Any advice on how to deal with that heat? (laughs) Well, um, I think you learn to adapt. It's kind of amazing. Um, You know, you turn off your air condition when the temperature drops below 90. You know, you feel like (laughs) it's really... Wear as little as possible. <laughs> Stay inside. Work at six in the morning. Take a nap at noon. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of, uh, and then get out as much as you can up into the mountains when you're, you're able to in the summer. Oh, that's great. I'm going to just get a wide brim hat too, you know, see if yeah, I can cover definitely. my. A hat and sunscreen all the time. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Hey, adapters, we are back on the final day of the NCARF conference. I am here with Bronwyn Gresham, clinical psychologist and volunteer with Psychology for a Safe Climate. Okay, so tell me what this organization is all about. So our organization is all about trying to support the engagement, the emotional engagement with climate change. We realized very early on that engaging with climate change is kind of more than a intellectual, rational task. It's an emotional issue as well. And we're finding that our work is now focusing on how to support people working in the field, those who are really connected with the urgency and seriousness of climate change and who are really feeling the impacts and the weight of responsibility of that knowing. Give me like a hypothetical person that you're helping and, and maybe kind of play with it a little. Go to the extreme. What what issues are they sort of dealing with and then you're coming in and helping with? So we deal with a lot of individuals from different professions and backgrounds. Uh, most of them would be working or volunteering in the space of climate change. And a lot of people contact us because they've reached burnout or compassion fatigue. So they're experiencing a sense of despair and hopelessness, anxiety, fear around the future. And it's often paired with this sense that they don't have the efficacy to make a real difference. So these are people who have usually been working in the field for a long time. They're veterans. They understand the science. They've been working long and hard about taking action, but they're coming up against the barriers, the structural barriers, the political will, and feeling quite despondent about it all. So these are the people that usually come to our workshops uh, in order to 
find a way through because we know when people become then disconnected from the work that they love, they feel even more miserable. All right. I don't know if this will be somewhat controversial, but I think like most of the people that I've worked with and I've done a lot of policy work with government, most of them are not on the cusp of burnout. You know, they're concerned. Should some of these people that I guess need your services, sh should they still be doing what they're doing? Of course they should be doing what they're doing. I think a lot of the time people have really healthy psychological coping strategies. They have a really broad, what we call window of tolerance to be able to stay attuned to the suffering in the world, but also work through it. But then there are some people, I guess if you've been in the positions and possibly maybe people who are really on the ground trying to implement the policies, who are really trying to create the change. And if they're coming up against structural barriers and they're, they're going to, it's kind of like you keep facing failures. And if you don't have a, a psychological process for dealing with failure, and I guess what they call flurning, you know, learning through your failure, it can, it can then lead to feeling like you're the failure, not the system. Tell me, how this kind of unfolds with what kind of groups? How, how would someone actually use your service? So often we run workshops around a particular theme and that might be around understanding ecological grief and loss or it might be around burnout and compassion fatigue. And the groups usually begin with a more creative, open process. So we, um, rather than asking people how they feel, which is a little bit intellectual, uh, we invite them into a process that allows emotions to come out more naturally. And this is usually through drawing or some kind of collage process. And through that, we find a lot of different emotions that people have expressed very unexpectedly. They didn't realize that they were feeling a lot of these emotions. And this is what we find when, when we talk about climate change. It elicits really strong negative emotions, even existential issues, which about humanity, our humanity, our children and our grandchildren, which we don't really on a day-to-day -day basis want to think about. And so these workshops provide a space for that to be expressed because we know if we don't express these emotions they and we push them down and we just kind of keep focusing on the positive and pushing the negative aside, there's this saying that what you resist will persist. We know these emotions will become expressed in some way through the body or mind in the future. So our workshops provide a bit of a space for people to get in touch with their emotions and then to talk about different ways of, of processing, digesting, moving through those emotions rather than those emotions being bad and something to be banished and thrown away. Oh, you're going to love me. But I want to keep pushing this. Is you, your background, you probably maybe have an opinion. You think of uh, soldiers who get what PD, PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Should they be going back into a, a, a theater of war? You know, it should ever, should they ever go back once they've like established it? And I'm going somewhere with this. Not if they're currently experiencing PTSD as an acute symptom. So if you put someone with current PTSD into a war zone, that is a recipe for disaster. That's, and they say you also can't do therapy in a war zone. However, we're not currently in the war zone, um, but people are experiencing PTSD. So they, they do need to, well, not just PTSD. And you think of people who have been through extreme weather events. It's really quite logical. It makes sense. We can understand that if there's been loss, whether it's loss of control or loss of possessions, that these people would feel traumatized from experiencing drought, floods, fires. But what's less recognized is the anxiety and fear in relation to future threat. And this is what we're coined eco-anxiety. This is what we're seeing a lot with the people who are working in this field. Yeah. And I guess I got to be not necessarily comparing, let's say, adaptation professionals to military service or in an active war zone. I'm not trying to do that, but the, the notion that there's psychological issues that you ne shouldn't necessarily expose them to again. So you're dealing with a population that you're trying to help them get through this. So is there a moment where they're cured and they can go back and fight the good fight on climate change? Absolutely. We know like psychological treatment works. And so if these individuals 
can have the insight and awareness that they are struggling and it's usually pretty obvious they usually do if they seek appropriate psychological support then yes recovery is possible and ex- and to be expected and to, so that they should be able to return to their work and their passion and and continue and sustain and feel nourished in that work so do you have any clients i mean does the government you work with them we don't work directly with the government. So our government here has in for private practitioners in psychology uh, called Medicare mental health care plans. People can access if they have a diagnosed condition, say depression or anxiety, they can access 10 sessions, up to 10 sessions with a Medicare rebate. But that's the limit of what the government provides in terms of supporting mental health treatment and care. Unless you've got a very severe mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, really severe depression or personality disorder issues. And then a lot of those individuals can be seen and experience treatment within them, the community mental health services. Okay, so back to So Medicare will cover 10 treatments and you, they can use that for what you offer if, it, if it's sort of manifesting itself as anxiety or depression and ultimately it's just the climate change. It's, that's, so they can do it. They can get treatment. Well, th- through... Psychology for a Safe Climate, they don't need to because we offer free workshops. We don't offer individual treatment. However, a lot of volunteers are working in private practice and we do have a list of psychologists, counsellors, psychiatrists who are working with a specialty in the field of climate change or at least an appreciation of the issues that, are, that we're facing. Um, very interesting. And, you know, I actually want to bring my listeners into the moment we had on, on Monday uh, when I gave the presentation and you asked me a question. Uh, if you could try to remember the question, I'll, I'll say it, but then I want to ask you kind of your thoughts on that. Sure. So uh, I guess I was really taken aback by how many people you talk to and how many stories you would be hearing of, and the diversity of those stories around adaptation and climate change. And You know, in order to really care about this stuff, we have to be attuned and sensitive to the misery and pain that we see because that's what compels us to do something about it. So I was really interested to hear how you cope, firstly from a personal level, but also to try to demonstrate to the the general audience that we all are human and we all feel about this stuff and we all have different ways of coping and caring for ourselves. And I just wanted to destigmatize that we can feel miserable about this stuff and to create some hope that, you know, we all cope in different ways. And so I asked you if you ever felt something like if you ever felt miserable or struggled with this issue and how you cope. Well, you said that you were too shallow to (laughs) feel miserable or something like that. And I didn't buy it. (laughs) Right, right. So that's why I want to follow up. And what did you really think when I, you know, I was being a little a bit flipped there, but I, there's certain truth to it. But I mean, you've dealt with enough people now. What, how, what's your sort of armchair, really quick psychology? I think you were trying to, there was, there's the fear, which many of us carry, that if we speak to the misery and pain, that people switch off. And in your work, you really want to inspire people and tell this as a good news story that we can adapt, that this is a way, this is an opportunity for the human race to evolve and be better. And that's the message that you're trying to portray. And so to think or even contemplate the pain and misery, um, there's the fear that that leads us down a very dark road of, of disconnection and, and despair. And from my perspective, it doesn't always lead down that road and the emotions are there anyway. Yeah. And I was hoping you didn't take <laughs> my answer as like dismissing what you, you were doing. It's, I guess, bring a little bit of humor into the situation. So any final thoughts? I guess just to acknowledge and that if, if listeners are feeling a little bit of misery out there, that they're, that this is well recognized, eco anxiety and also grief and loss around um, what we anticipate we will lose, but what people have also lost in their sense of place, that these issues are real, that they're not brought on by themselves, that there's not something wrong with them for, th- for feeling this way, that this is part of the human condition, and to talk to someone about it and think about how you can understand what you're feeling and harness it in a way that brings you purpose and meaning and empowerment. So if there was anyone or groups in the U.S. who were interested in working with you, do you work overseas? 
We don't work overseas. We're a very small <laughs> volunteer organisation. We don't have much funding, but we are connected with um, people like in the American Psychological Association. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, adapters, and I am with Julia Stanley from Bar and Water. I am a senior planner in climate change, so I coordinate our climate change mitigation and adaptation work. So what exactly is your organization? It's not quite a city government. What are you? So we're owned by the state government, but we're a bit removed. The technical term is a statutory authority, but mainly we bring water to people's houses and take their sewage away. So that's a simple. Okay, now just describe the geographic region. Help us visualize where this area that you represent the people, and is it beautiful? I mean, what, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so it's about an hour uh, southwest of Melbourne, and it is a lot of it is coastline, beautiful coastline. People may have heard of the Great Ocean Road. But, yeah, we have a lot of uh, beautiful rainforests, coasts, inland grasslands. Our population surges dramatically over summer because we have a lot of people coming down to the beach. So that, that's one of our challenges is the fact that our peak demands are huge compared to the actual permanent population. So you're dealing with water, but what, what does climate change mean for you? How are you adapting to climate change? Are you, are you dealing with sea level rise or is this issues of drought and water volume? What exactly are you adapting to? All of that. I mean, obviously drought and reduced rainfall is going to have a big impact seeing that we deliver water. <laughs> to people but we have a lot of assets some of those are on the coast so sea level rise will be an issue to us but also bushfire even just things like soil cracking will do a lot of damage to pipes and i think also just we, we have a small part to play in kind of the urban resilience so water in cities and you know how how can we change the way we use water in cities to make them um, more resilient to climate change Okay, so have you learned anything specifically? Are you, you going to go back from this conference and say <laughs> it was worth me coming to this thing? Yeah, it was definitely, definitely worth coming to this thing. But don't ask me one, one takeaway because there's so many at the moment. <laughs> so I have, I've written a very long list of different things to look up into, you know, in terms of different financing models, different technical ways to think about climate risk or kind of fancy computational models that we could use to um, model the impact of climate change on our infrastructure, ideas of how to engage better with the community and the Indigenous community in particular. So one, I think that one of the great things about the conference has been the breadth of topics. You know, today I've heard about climate bonds and then I've heard about um, visual reality tools to imagine, you know, what, what a city might look like, you know, during a climate emergency. How does your office communicate to the public about climate change? You're obviously focused on it, you're dedicating staff, but is this something you're doing much outreach to the public on? It's something that we're starting to do more of. Certainly, like, if we're in a drought, which we, you know, during the millennial drought, there was a lot of communications, you know, with the community about water use, how to, how to save water, what we're doing. But other than that, most of our work has really been about getting our own house in order. And I think a lot of the time... You know, people just want water to come out of the tap and the toilet to flush and they don't necessarily engage that much with what we're doing or what climate change might mean for us. But I think that's starting to change. Okay, one last question. Is there anything you can do about the flies that attack you when you're going on the Great Ocean Road? <laughs> um, I would recommend a good mosquito repellent. That's about all I've got for you. I'm sorry. You've just got to be quick and slap them. It really is quite shocking. You go in, and it's the Twelve Apostles, right? Yes. And you go out there, and it's the most one of these beautiful views you'll ever see in your life. And you spend the whole time whacking yourself with these flies. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, I, I don't have a simple answer for you. <laughs> you just learn to live with it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that re-release. What a treat getting down to Australia. It's one of my favorite places and the people are amazing. If you're an Aussie listening to this, reach out. Let me know what's going on with Adaptation in Victoria. 
or the other states for that matter. And yes, if you're interested in partnering with me to highlight adaptations down under, let me know. Okay, upcoming episodes, I traveled to Trinidad and Tobago to record a podcast for the Keeping History Above Water Conference. It was a great experience discovering how that island and other islands in the regions will adapt to a changing climate. Also went to Columbus, Ohio to interview speakers and attendees at Patel's Innovation and Climate Resilience Conference. What a great time. I got to meet quite a few listeners and previous guests on the show. Stay tuned for those episodes. Okay, so does your organization have a powerful and inspiring story of climate change adaptation to share with the world like I did in this episode in Australia? Well, imagine showcasing it on a widely acclaimed podcast with a large network of climate and adaptation professionals. America Adapts offers you the perfect platform to tell your story and spread your message to a global audience. By sponsoring an episode, not only will you be sharing your story to the world, but you will also be incorporating a podcast episode as part of your organization's long-term communication strategy. Don't limit your communication toolkit to just webinars and white papers. They can be dry and forgettable. You'll get to work with me personally to identify the experts that represent the amazing work you're doing. Give your organization a dynamic and engaging way to communicate with members, board members, and funders. Make a lasting impact by using the power of podcast storytelling to captivate your audience and bring your message to life. Some of my previous partners include Patel, NRDC, University of Pennsylvania at Warden, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard University, and some corporate clients. Discover the enduring value of podcasts as they continue to promote your story long after its initial release. Learn more by emailing me at americadaps at gmail.com. And as the host of America Daps, I'm always eager to connect with my listeners and hear their feedback on the show. Whether you want to share your thoughts or suggest a guest you'd like to hear from, I'm open to it all. Your input not only helps me improve the show, but also can lead to exciting new opportunities. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with that same email, americadaps at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.